Nowadays, maybe even more than ever, the average person in the mainstream media are intrigued by the concepts and the rise of AI and UAP. Are there parallels in the rise of these two subjects? Jacques Vallée, notable computer scientist, author, and ufologist, delves into the intersections of artificial intelligence and the unexplained. Throughout his career, Jacques has witnessed the evolution of AI and UAP research, from AI's humble beginnings to its current state he has seen it grow and transform into a powerful tool with both exciting possibilities and really concerning implications. Today, we'll delve into Valet's thoughts on the current state of AI and UAPs, exploring what excites him but also concerns him about their present and future state. Join us as we get rebelliously curious. Jacques, thank you so much for joining me on Rebelliously Curious again. It is such a pleasure to have you back. And also thank you for contributing your recent article to The Debrief. I know that it has done extremely well. It is called Non-Human Intelligence at the Threshold. If people have not read it, please go to thedebrief.org and take a look. But again, thank you so much, Jock, for being here today. Thank you. To start off, can you walk me through your first experiences at Northwestern working with AI? So um, I worked at Northwestern um, in the uh, uh, early days of uh, Northwestern's computer science development. In fact, I, I saw the, the new computation center being built on the Lake Phil. Uh, it was a very ambitious project for, for Northwestern and very imaginative. And uh, it was the first building that was that was built on the, the land that was uh, um, uh, filled over the, the the beach over the lake, and so it was very exciting. And we had a, a new computer, and we were using it for astrophysics. I was working on the team of Dr. Heineck, um, and it wasn't. A coincidence. I mean, we had wanted to combine the data we had about UFOs, but most of my work at the computation center was while I was doing my PhD was with astrophysics and with the medical school. Medical school was down in uh, downtown Chicago and had uh, very high demands to move all their records into digital form. This was, again, uh, 1965, 1966. Um, and uh, those were you know, very busy days for uh, the computer, uh, computer technology. One of the things I had done for the observatory was uh, computerizing the, uh, the 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 catalog of bright stars uh, northwestern had specialized in the the bright star catalogs there are you know roughly let's say 10,000 bright stars you can only see 5,000 at a time because there are two hemispheres and uh it uh, so it sounds like a small number. The problem is that they are very complicated because we know everything about those stars because they are very bright. So we can see there are double stars, we can see clusters, we can see you know all kinds of different different things at that uh, at that level of uh, of light, at that level of luminosity. So it it ends up being a large catalog for the days. Uh, you know, computers were not <laughs> nothing like uh, you know what we can do now, and um, astronomers who worked with the catalog had to punch cards uh, to for their program when they want, wanted to retrieve data and do 
comparisons of different types of stars over the entire sky. So uh, it was a lengthy process. And uh, in those days, uh, the, the program would be performed, would be compiled overnight, and you'd have your results the next, uh, the next day. For my uh, for my PhD, I, I I looked at different kinds of um, possibilities. I'd done a lot of work with um, the medical center, so I could use I had access to medical data that were very very interesting and very challenging. But uh, you know, my first love was astronomy, and uh, I thought if I could, I wondered if I could um, accelerate the process of giving answers to the astronomers. Uh, if I could take English questions about the catalog and uh, a program, uh, you know, an AI system that would give answers right away. So they wouldn't have to compile their own program and do it overnight. And I learned a lot from that. The first thing I learned is that my uh, my advisor in computer science didn't think it could be done. In those days, there had only been about four um, demonstrations of AI that were, there were a couple at um, Harvard and MIT, and there was one at Stanford. The one at Stanford was really the only science program it was a, a program developed to study complex molecules. And um, it had amazed the scientific community that you could, you could do that with artificial intelligence. It was a program called Dendral, D-E-N-D-R-A-L, which was really the first demonstration of AI in real science, in, 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 in chemistry. And uh, so um, my, my advisor said, well, it, uh, it probably cannot be done, but you should try anyway, which was a, you know, a challenge. So uh, I thought that was, uh, that was fair, and um, it turned out I could do it. And we learned it, it took you know, a number of months of programming and reprogramming and testing and so on. But I learned I learned a lot from it. And uh, we all learned a lot from it, including the astronomers who found out that they didn't have to write a program every time they were looking for a particular type of statistics in astrophysics. The, the program I developed would take, and it relates to today, you know, today, we sure. talk about the, you can interrogate a, a large database in English, or you can ask um, philosophical questions and get complex answers um, in in full English. Uh, however, you know people should not be too enthusiastic too quickly. And there are articles coming out now saying, wait a minute, those are demonstration programs, but the reality is going to be a little bit more difficult because there are questions a machine cannot answer. So the uh, my program was with a limited vocabulary of astronomy. So it was much better defined because as astronomers know precise terms, you know, uh, frequency or binary star, you know, the, the, the color of a star, the spectrum, quality, the speed of the star, those are well defined. So that makes my, my job easier, you know, but remember it was 1967, so not 1997 uh, and certainly not, uh, you know, 2000 and something. So, um, I found that the, the, the they were asking two types of questions. How many stars in this large catalog have certain characteristics in color, in speed, you know, in uh, displacement, uh, in uh, in combination of parameters, and so that was fairly well defined. 
and there was a well-defined vocabulary. So I could I could translate English into a formula that could ap apply to a, a form of the catalog that the system would regenerate for that formula. I couldn't apply it to the catalog as it was, but I could re transform the catalog and the question so they would meet and get an answer. The other type of question, which was more complex and uh, more challenging and, and more interesting, was um, what is the proportion of spectroscopic binary stars among stars that have this kind of color, this kind of speed? So uh, we, we had stars that were very complex, stars that were triple stars, stars that were triple binary stars. In other words, three double stars moving around each other. You know, yeah. that exists also. So in among the bright stars, you cannot see that kind of detail with the, you know, the, the faint stars in the galaxy, but you certainly can see it in the environment around our sun. So that was that was very interesting. And uh, people were surprised that it could be done. And uh, I expanded on the technology, you know, for my for my PhD, for my uh, doctor's uh, dissertation. But what I, I gained some you know I, I I, I shouldn't say that it wasn't that hard, but once you had done the basic work, it wasn't that hard to give answers to the astronomers that saved them, you know, 24 hours for every program. Sure. So that was considerable, you know, difference where they didn't have to write programs anymore. What I found is that the 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 difficulty wasn't to give and this applies to today you know surprisingly if if you give me a clear question well formed in the english language and i have the data for that question as a programmer i should be able to give you an exact answer or or, or an answer that helps you in your research um, I I could do it by developing a program, but I should be able to do it by understanding your question and responding to your question in a logical way. The problem is if your question is ambiguous, and that's what we see now, you know, right. with chat, GDP, and those other questions are the the. The area is so broad now that people are going to ask vague questions that don't really have a precise answer, like I did, you know, in astronomy. So um, my job, when I spend the most time in programming, you know, in the craft of programming my program, once it worked, was to catch the questions that I should not answer. If you ask me, how many stars are there? You could ask that question, and I could generate a formula, and the formula could go through the entire catalog, and in those days, it would take several minutes of wasted time, because I already know the answer. I already know how many stars there are in the catalog. So I should, I should intercept your question, and I should not generate a formula for to get the answer, because I already know the answer. I should give you the clear answer, you know, to your clear question. There were other questions that could be, um, that would not have an answer because they were not well formed, you know. Um, uh, how many stars have no color? Well, uh, you know, that's not, again, that's not a question that is relevant in, in astrophysics. So I would, um, uh, I, I should not, I should be able to detect 
questions like that and give you a polite answer like could you could you reframe it in terms of you know the the colors that are uh, recognized for on the spectrum uh, on the spectral uh, differences of the stars so uh, we can then engage in this dialogue until there is a the, the question is fit something that that makes sense in science and that the program can answer. That's where I spend the most time. The disambiguation, you know, of of the English question. And that's today, that's a problem that, you know, the the new the the the, the, the new languages are going to have. Uh, that's where they will be tested because I, I should not if I give you an answer that looks right to a question that wasn't right, we are going to lead you into mistakes. Would you be able to break down how AI has evolved over the years? Uh, well, it's understandable that, you know, it's a new toy, so everybody wants to use it. and uh, But that's good because we're going to find out what it's really good for, and where we're going to need a lot more work in the in the structure, in the language, in the disambiguation, which is a horrible word. Uh, but uh, you find that in other applications of AI, you know, after that, uh, as as you know, I've worked, I've done a lot of work with catalogs of UFOs starting in the 1960s, since I had brought um, the, the French catalogs, uh, both of the French Air Force and, and private catalogs we had developed and merged them with the catalogs that I developed with Dr. Heineck from the Air Force files and from other American files. So when we started doing that, um, the, in those days, uh, the the Air Force had developed a, a questionnaire, you know, that you could, yeah, the witnesses would have to fill out. And it took 10 pages. And it was developed wow. colleges and so on. And, and they would have questions like, um, uh, you know, did uh, what... Um, what well, what was the shape of it? Uh, well, if it's a light that you saw at night, you might not have seen a shape, so you might not be able to answer those questions. So, whether the uh, the, the witness was uh, seeing something during the day or at night or in cloudy conditions and so on, you would, if you were face to face with the person, you would then go into a different type of question. Well, an intelligent program can do that. The program already knows it was two o'clock in the morning. So it's not going to expect that you saw the kind of detail that, for example, it's not going to ask, did you see a shadow? Because it's two o'clock in the morning, there isn't going to be any shadow, and it knows where the moon was and so on. So it, it can save you a lot of time and have a much more friendly attitude to the poor witness that's trying to give you the details of what they saw. So um, I worked on that and that was a fun, uh, you know, development. Uh, I showed it recently to uh, uh, the son of Dr. Heineck and we had a good time you know, looking at that, that, that little program. Um, Later, uh, as you know, I worked in. I was recruited to, to work in venture capital, and I worked on, with a number of um, companies that were using AI, not the linguistic AI, but were right. using AI to guide machines or to replace uh, humans in factories, and so on. So, um, one one of those was a very a very interesting company that had developed a uh, a system for to use hard X-rays for brain tumors to to uh, to to treat brain tumors that were not operable. So now you could operate on patients who before 
you know, would have died from from that tumor because the a surgeon would not have access to it with a normal uh, a normal device. And the alternative was was radiation, very hard radiation, which was uh, very very complex and very difficult, both for the doctors and for the patients, and was not very successful in the, the radiation surgery. And uh, the the team was at Stanford University, and uh, I financed that team, uh, and then brought in other other investors. Uh, the company eventually went public at a billion and a half valuation. Wow! Dollars. So that was that was a success for artificial intelligence because the the machine would have a map of the brain of that particular patient and a map of the tumor. And the, the machine would develop a set of radiation rays that could essentially uh, treat the tumor. It might take several, no, several modes and then eliminate the tumor, but the, the patient could move a little bit, so it was a lot more comfortable because the machine would detect motions of the head and would remap its program to deliver to to find the best way to deliver the same dose of radiation at the same cubic millimeter inside the brain after the patient had moved. Nobody had done that before, and wow. well, that was a proof of AI. But that was twenty five years ago. And people don't realize that we were able to do that. You know, we were able to um, or, or already to use some some of the principles of AI and in machines. You know, the, uh, General Electric was already using it twenty years ago in locomotives. You know, uh, locomotives that would cost you know between twenty and seventy million dollars but would recognize when something was about to fail. You don't want the locomotive to fail with a train in the middle of the desert, you know, where you have to send you know, equipment to get, the, to, to, to get the train out of there and then fix the locomotive. A locomotive knows, can detect things that are about to fail in its own internal, you know, thousands of devices inside the locomotive, and then it can direct itself to a repair, repair center where you can substitute another locomotive. So those are things that people don't know about, but that, uh, you know, devices that are intelligent to the point where they can communicate with a small team of humans who would just control the process, but the locomotive essentially will tell you what's wrong with it and and what parts it's going to need. And you can you can help direct it to uh, a, a, a repair center that has the particular parts now. And that translates into a lot of money. Right. And yeah. you're bridging me into the next question I want to ask you is about the dangers within AI right now, because we're seeing that if we have, you know, the maybe the wrong data that's put in, or again, we're asking the wrong questions and we're not phrasing the right way, you know, from the past to now to the present, what are the dangers right now with artificial intelligence that you can see? So the... Um... One of the major areas of application is in defense, because uh, humans can do certain things in analysis, but it takes too long. You know, in, in today's military environment, whether that's on the battlefield or whether that's, you know, in space um, or in, in, in combat, in air combat. So there is a, a, a lot of development that would take place there which is not uh, the, the, you know, a dialogue with the machine. It, it's a perception of a very complex space with things moving 
within it with different signatures. So it's it's a problem of recognizing signatures. And of course, you know, with UFOs, we have that problem. Do we, is, is it just a balloon? Uh, or is it, uh, some, is it something that's going to accelerate and surprise us with uh, the, way, the way it's going to behave? And how should we react to it? So, uh, and if it's a balloon, is it our balloon? Or is it something that shouldn't be there that belongs to another country? So uh, uh, all those programs are being developed now and being refined. And uh, they can be applied, of course, to uh, aviation, to civil aviation, uh, and they can be applied to, of course, research on UFOs, which is where, where they become very, very uh, challenging and interesting. Now, where do you see the similarities then between UAP and AI? So there are similarities in the technology because we share networks and we have to discriminate about among objects among the real world so the we we have an, an ai system if you will if you will want to think of a robot you know it could be a robot it could be a humanoid robot but it most of the time is going to be a set of devices maybe distributed devices collaborating to make a decision or to propose a decision to humans, you know, like the locomotive. <laughs> but, so uh, it's encouraging to know that locomotives have been doing that for 20 years and people are not aware of it. But the, it's also interesting because of the the challenges that they, that they pose, you know, the... Uh, there is a real concern among the the general population about the use of AI. You know, obviously, will AI replace replace me in my job? I mean, that's a concern that you know many people will have if they have a a, a, a mechanical. That's always it's already happened in electronics. Uh, it's happened in electronics because it came to a point where even if you wanted to use human beings, you couldn't anymore. You know, in a, in, in, in a device like this, you know, there's a memory, there are you know, megabytes, thousands or millions of megabytes of information and uh, millions of bytes of information. And uh, the, the, the structure is too small for human beings to do it. So we become used to having robots assembling these devices now. The question is, you know, is it going to replace complex jobs that humans take pride in accomplishing? Is it, if it, it's okay, if it just makes it faster to do something or easier to do something or less, less dangerous to do something, but um, what if it can replace a, a human worker completely? Uh, so the, the question also is, uh, which you know, the leaders in AI have been asking, and it's a real question, can it get to the point where we are not going to understand the decisions that these systems make and the scale, how do we stop them? To stop them, we have to understand what they do. And it could come to a point that we can see with today's problems where we don't understand what they do. One of the, one of the problems we had with the medical company was that the, uh, the uh, you know, in, in the US, you have to prove that a program will always do what it's supposed to do. Well, in AI, you there may be situations that you were not able to test. So we, for a long time, we could not get clearance for our device. And it was going to be a robot that would cost $2 million for the hospital, 
Now, it, it saved money for the hospital because there was no hospitalization needed and you didn't need uh, uh, an environment that was radioactive anymore, which was you know, a, a great progress for, for the doctors. But we couldn't prove to the FDA that the robot would always do the same thing because it wouldn't do always the same thing. It would adapt to the patient position, which saved having to screw in a metal helmet to immobilize a patient, which led to hospitalization, led to other costs, and so on. So the, the benefits meant that we had to trust the robot. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, this was a large robot that was going to go around you, you know, and essentially zap you with hard, hard rays that uh, were not radioactive, but still were damaging the tissue. So uh, that we almost ran out of money because of that. We could not get the clearance for you know as a medical device from the fda uh we we managed to get over that by proving on uh extreme cases you know on uh humani you know humanitarian cases that that the device did work on large quantities of our patients so we are going to run into the same problem again in the future applications of AI. So, you know, we, we had that experience with this uh, this medical company. We're going to have the same problem with UFOs, you know. Um, the, if, if you apply AI to recognize enemy airplanes, well, we know what enemy airplanes look like, you know, through intelligence and through, uh, you know, what... Uh, observation and so on. And uh, with UFOs, we don't know that. Uh, we That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the, an unknown configuration answer. If you remember, um, you know, the, 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 the Nimitz incident over the Pacific, there is still a question of what was the exact shape, you know, of that, uh, of that white cylinder uh, right. object. On that tic tac, right. um, well, how many tic tacs are there, and are, are they, do they always have the same size? You know, those are questions that people are going to want to ask. So, um, the the similarities are there between, you know, what uh, what what we've done with with uh, general AI and and what's going to happen. the The other question is, what are the dangers? You know what? What are the dangers in terms of UFOs? You know uh, where? Where? Can, how far can we go in recognizing these? And what is it a threat? So we're going to ask to at some point we're going to ask the system to characterize something as a threat. But you see, in medicine, we knew everything about the device we had. We knew how it could reposition itself if the patient moved, which was unheard of, uh, you know, because, again, we're looking at one cubic millimeter inside somebody's brain, and we have to be able to track that in an unpredictable environment. Well, we're going to have the same, a similar thing with UFOs, except we don't know what UFOs are. We don't know what they can do. We don't know what guidance system they have. We don't know what intelligence they have. Is there someone, somebody inside? Is it a robot? What kind of robot? How can it? How can we, de, you know, develop that knowledge? So that's the next. That's the frontier, and that's where we meet, you know, the people who develop. Um, uh, uh, Chat GPD and and the other the other systems in Silicon Valley, so it's going to be a very interesting, uh, very interesting day. A hundred percent, and I like the fact that you said about we have to trust AI because it's predicting right now. We're not we have some 
data that we're putting in, but realistically, we are asking potentially for predictions. So we do have to put a lot of trust into that. Why do you think that UFOs, UAPs, and AI are on the same rise at the same time? Like, why do you think this is happening simultaneously? Well, they, you know, UFOs have always been there. That's one argument I would, I would say, you know, from uh, my uh, my work with ancient uh, records of, of UFOs. Again, here a AI can help us in characterizing what has changed and what hasn't changed when we go back to, you know, the 18th century when. Uh, we have descriptions of UFOs by astronomers, you know, right. what a concept, you know. Um, so we we can we can track that, and it's not a new thing. It's uh, uh, again, you know, uh, my my program could help the the Air Force, you know, deal with UFO reports back in the 1980s. This was, you know, before people knew, uh, before people could use the internet, you know. Uh, so the it it it's not new, it, it, it but it's a the the tool makes it convenient to uh, uh, to to look for solutions in both areas, and both areas can learn something from each other, because in in both areas, you have uh, people describing something that is not recognized. You have you have a, the problem of applying recognition to a particular physical or linguistic situation. So there is a similarity there, and we're going to make the same mistakes <laughs> in both cases, and that's. That's how you learn. I mean, you learn from mistakes, from things that don't work. So um, the, the the other thing is that we are going to be in a, in a linguistic environment where certainly in in interviewing a witness of a UFO case, we can use all the lessons that. We we can get now from uh, you know from the the big uh, natural language AI systems that are coming to you know to this computer, um, so we we can begin to facilitate a process that was really complex and difficult before. You had to transcribe, you had to do all those things. Uh, a lot of that can be done faster and uh, hopefully better. But again, we have to build those guidelines around what the system does. I think for a long time, people will have the impression that, you know, AI is magic because it, it is magic. It seems that it, it understands you. You know, one of the very early programs in AI, was uh, before my program, you know, somebody at uh, MIT had developed a, 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 a psychiatrist, an automatic psychiatric interview, uh, you know, of a, of a crazy patient. And uh, the patient was paranoid and they uh, would actually stop the conversation if he didn't like what the doctor was saying, and that was very funny. I mean, uh, a lot of students spent hours, you know, uh, experimenting with the program, and uh, you you got to be the doctor. And the program was was a paranoid program, and uh, so we're coming back to that with, you know, three generations of systems now of much greater sophistication, but it, it will be used in in the medical interviews. Uh, it, it it will be used in a number of situations. It will be used in, it's already used in law, where the, the, the place where I look forward to it being used with UFOs is that people, you know, ufologists have theories. They think that UFOs turn blue when they accelerate. Well, yeah, we have some cases where 
That's true. Is it always true? You know, we have a catalog, as you know, that I contributed to designing, uh, which is still classified, but um, people, uh, you know, it's been published that that catalog had 260,000 cases of selected UFO cases around the world, all in English with the same structure. Well, in, among that catalog, there are thousands of cases where people have seen a UFO that accelerated. Did it always turn blue? Or were there cases where it didn't have any light? Were there cases where it turned red and when it accelerated? So we're going to be able to answer those questions much better. To, uh, it, it's important to, to, to raise a question but now we'll have a tool that will enable us to, 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 to really test it. And then we can start building theories, physical theories, that will tell us something about the, the phenomenon. So that's a, you know, it's, it's kind of application that I look forward to that uh, I'd like to see being developed. When we start to use it in that application, it'll be really exciting. Uh, looking at QSTAR right now, they're, right now QSTAR is being built and developed. How do you think the application of QSTAR, because it's based around mathematics and mathematical theory, how will that affect the research? How will that affect UAP research? Um, I, I see it as you know, just a normal step in the, the evolution of the, the programs. I, it doesn't change the you know the basic uh, applications of the uh, of the technology. We're going to see. I think the inspiration now is going to come from applications. That's certainly what you know what happened hist historically to uh, to AI. The uh, uh, I think Q, Q star is you know is one is broadening the, the field of application and, and refining it. But I think the inspiration is going to come from the people subscribing to these systems and complaining that it, it doesn't quite do what they want in different fields. You know, we already have the, the lawyers saying, wait a minute, you, you know, you, uh, your systems are are fine, but they are too primitive to really understand what I do in the courtroom. Okay, so yes, I can. They can quickly look at the the you know the, the judicial literature to find a, a case law that could apply to this particular situation, but it it, it still takes a lot of human development before it will mean something with those particular plaintiffs in that particular courtroom. So the, the AI doesn't know about that. It just knows that there is a text that matches a particular situation in law. That doesn't mean you should use it. It doesn't mean it's completely irrelevant and so on. Uh, so the... I think we're going to see a, 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 a normal process that we've always seen in, in the development of computers. You know, the applications themselves inform the next generation of hardware. Uh, should the computer see? Should the computer hear? Should the computer deal with images? Is that more important than some other thing? And that defines where the technology is going to go. I mean, what kind of, of circuit you're going to build. So and we, we certainly see that with the AI, with specialized circuits that will process AI faster, um, to uh, again, to, to make it more convenient. So I think we're, we're going to see development that comes from you you and me and people who have real life, you know, real, real world, applications that they want to use it for, it's not going to be reserved to 
you know, very esoteric theoretical things in the classified domain and so on. It's going to be everywhere. Does the concept of sentient AI change how we potentially might research UFOs in the future or how we relate to UFOs in the future and the concept of UAP? Uh, absolutely. Even in in the, the interview with a patient, you know, if you have that, that's, I'm, I'm glad you're asking that because that's been very important to me. The, the AI is not, I'm not going to turn the case over to some sort of robot. I'm going to be, it, it, and it's much more enjoyable and much more fascinating to have an, an AI companion that can guide the, the interaction and remember the interaction better than I can, can remind me of things to ask, of, you know, when people investigate UFOs, and I've seen that with the Air Force, I've seen that with, in France, as you know, I'm, I'm on the, uh, the French committee that from, um, uh, from the, the space agency that is going to go into the field and interview people. The, 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 the dialogue is made, uh, is made difficult because when, when in, the, in the conversation or in the, in the interrogation, if you want, there is, you can only think as a human of, you know, a dozen possibilities when you're in front of the of the person, you know, that and, and you can only, you think of a particular set of questions to ask. A, a robot would look at two hundred, you know, in in the system that I built, there were over two hundred possible things to look at that could explain that particular observation. If I'm in the field with someone. I'm only going to have command of maybe 10 or 12. You know, I'm not going to go through, my brain isn't going to have, isn't going to have present to my mind 200 possibilities at the same time. Right, it's not humanly so possible. AI can guide me, you know, you, you forgot to ask, you know, uh, how the, 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 if it was blurry at a particular point, when the person saw it, or was it always precise and clear? Well, I might not remember to ask that question, but it could be an important question at that particular point. Yeah, a hundred percent. And its memory and data collection will be so much stronger than ours would would ever be. It it doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh smarter than I am. <laughs> you know, at least I, my pride is is uh, reacts to what you say. Uh, the, it, it, it simply means that I'm going to save time in going through all the hypotheses and I'll know that I haven't forgotten anything. You know, that I, I, I'm not going to go home and say, oh, you know, I should have asked, you know, which which happens so so often. So it it's really having a, a trusted friend. It, it, it's not going to be, you know, it, it's not going to do the interview. It cannot do the interview because so much is in the human connection, you know, in the uh, human to human reaction uh, that I'm going to be guided by that person. There may be silences or hesitations that I'll notice that where I want to go back uh, or I want to give the person time to remember something where a robot would just push, 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 push through a list of situations, okay? I, I, I will know when to let go of certain things and come back later and, and so on. Uh, it's not going to be mechanical, but if the, the robot at the same time can say, don't forget to ask about 
you know, how it disappeared, you know, uh, or were there times where it wasn't visible and then it became visible again? Okay, uh, that not that might not come to my my mind, and it might not come to the mind of uh, the witness to mention that. I like that you brought that up because, for example, if an AI is a researcher or an interviewer to an experiencer that has seen and witnessed a UFO, do you think the AI will be sentient sentient enough to have an idea on how to capture feelings and emotions from the experiencer witnessing the UFO incident? Do you think that we'll be able to you know, play it as a, as a partner for both of us where it will be a give and take relationship, like you're saying, but do you think that it will have more of a sentient feeling and, and, um, and more human realistic feeling where it would know how to empathize with the experiencer witnessing a UFO sighting? I can think of some movies, uh, you know, where the robot lies to the interviewer. And right. The, the question is to detect the lie of the robot. And I, 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 I don't think we're there yet. Okay. But uh, we are certainly at the point where what I'm afraid of is that people will, it it will look so slick, you know, and precise, that people will overestimate the mind behind the robot. Well, there is no mind be, behind the robot. You know, there is a complex program that reorganizes itself kind of like what a mi the mind does but it's not it, it, it it's not the brain it's not so do you mind. think we'll stop critically thinking then uh i think people will have to learn their hard way you know that it it can lead you to trust it in conditions where you should not be trusting it uh um. So, that makes sense. Yeah, the, the the problem is, especially in English, in the English language, um, you no. Know, how do you how do you stop it? How do you lead it to contradict itself the way you would with a with another human? You know, you know. Now you you're telling me it was blue, but. Earlier, you said something that could imply it was red. You know, or, or can you can you explain that? That's the kind of thing we do when we when we talk to a person. Uh, but the it's going to be for a while. It's going to the robot is going to be so intimidating that because it's going to look very clever, very very clever. So. You have a reaction of trusting it too much. Uh, you'll have to be able to catch it on, um, uh, you know, things that are mistakes or things that are contradictory, and and that's going to be that's going to be difficult to do. When do you think we stop and pull the plug on AI? Then, like, what's your threshold in your mind? Um, I do, I don't know. There are lots of things we don't know. What I can tell you is I see, you know, my friends around me in in Silicon Valley uh, uh, amazed with, uh, you know, they said, uh, they asked, uh, what's the difference in the, uh, the art of painting between Van Gogh and, you know, some other, and, and they get a long dissertation from, you know, the AI explaining things by, you know, alluding to different paintings and different styles and so on. I mean, it looks perfect. So it's the end of the story. They were not at the point yet where they would, there would be a dialogue where we would challenge the AI, uh, you know, and say, Wait a minute. If you compare, you know this pay this artist to this artist, then you should also do it from the point of view of, you know, some other theory of art. And then, when we begin to see dialogues like that, 
that's when it's going to become really interesting. Can you can you get the robot to break down? Can you get it to a level of complexity where it uh, uh, contradicts itself? I think we will. Uh, I'm I'm sure we will. And so that's where that's a point where we're, we're really going to to be able to learn something. Now with UFOs, we're going to have that right away because we don't know what UFOs are. So we, we will be, we'll have to disagree, you know, two people asking the same AI about the same case are going to get different answers from the way they ask the question. And then there will be a reconciliation you know between between the two and that's that's where as as a you know if I still an AI programmer that's where I would like to be you know watching the dialogue and taking it home to to rework the the, the, the to replay the the situation AI and UFOs are both non-human Right. And they both have the potential to control humanity, potentially. Right. Potentially. So how will these two subjects influence society and each other in the future? Well, I could imagine a situation where the UFO asks, you know, let me talk to your AI. Oh, my gosh, you're right. Um, the. The situations, I think people generally, in the, you know, my friends would disagree with me on that, and they do, but I, I think we're looking at the dialogue with UFOs the way we have started to look at dialogue with uh, apes and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the higher level, the whales and the orcas. Um, and um, th that's not going to work because they, in most situations where there is a dialogue, dialogue is in English. In other words, you know, a, a witness confronts a, a humanoid that has come out of a UFO or a humanoid on board the UFO and um, uh, the uh, humanoid is going to speak English. There is no difference in language, and but it may speak English in a way that's absurd. And we'll have to deal with absurdity the way people would deal with uh, then, you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping well, that's absurd, but it's absurd in a particular way for a particular way of thinking. And um, the, the, there are a number of situations. I've spent a lot of time looking at the dialogues in the field between a witness who is surprised by encountering a UFO and encountering a... Um, a, a, a humanoid or a voice that dialogues with it, and very often the 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 questions are absurd. But when you analyze the absurdity, you know absurdity is doesn't mean that it's meaningless. You know, the, uh, absurdity can mean that the the meaning is at a higher level. There is a case in France where a witness went through a wood at night. He was a night watchman, was going to his job um, in a clearing in the, the, the wood he was going through. There was a large disc. There was a, a humanoid in front of the, the disc, and the humanoid asked, where am I? Um, am I in Italy or Germany? The witness said, you're in Alsace, you're in France. Then he said, um, what time is it? And the witness said, 
it's 2.30 in the morning. And the humanity said, you're lying, it's 4 o'clock. That's absurd. I mean, it was 2.30. Right. And he was in France. He was in, not in Germany or Italy. And, you know, there's a whole of Switzerland between Germany and Italy. So he was lost. He was really completely lost. So people didn't believe the witness when he told that So He said, you must have been dreaming. You know, you were still asleep and going to your job in the morning. But one question was absurd about time, and one was about space, as if to say there is no time and there is no space. And when, when I talked to uh, Eric Davis, who's a physicist, and I've done a lot of, had the, ple the pleasure of doing a lot of work, you know, jointly with, with uh, groups in research, um, is telling me that physics today says there is no space and there is no time. Those are things that we experience as a result of being placed in a much more complex physical situation that we perceive as you know that as we we behave within that situation as if there was time and space. Well, that night watchman going through the forest, that's essentially what he was told in a way that was completely absurd in English, or in French in, the, in that particular case. There are cases like that in in English where the, the, the witness, Shermer, uh, in 1965, is a patrolman, highway patrolman, is Kansas, in, in, in Kansas, he's driving along, he sees an object off the side of the road. He thinks there may be an accident or there may be something. It's at, at night. Um, he stops his patrol car, goes towards it. Um, again, two humanoids take him inside. The inside is much larger than the outside. That was, I think, the first instance where I, I noticed that and I published it, you know, in the 60s. It was the first time that, uh, you know, uh, ufologists had to deal with the fact that UFOs were not crafts, that as we understand the craft, that they were manipulating the topology of space time. Now, that's a different kind of thing. You know, it's not an aircraft. It's not the spacecraft. Do you think that later on that AI will be able to look at those past cases well, and have it, a better idea of what was going on? It looks like these two, um, one of these humanoids took him. He was now in a very large you know, hemisphere, very large. And there was a, a way to go up to the top. They took him up to the top. And they told him, watchman, they call him watchman, not patrolman, watchman, uh, because they could tell what the car did, <laughs> was. Um, someday you will see the universe. In English, because he had, he had the, the phrase in English in his head. There was no, it's not like communicating with whales Communicating with whales is fascinating. We have everything to learn about it, but this is not the same situation. They they control the language. Correct. But when we're looking, no, I, I hear what you're saying, Jacques. You know, when we're looking at those cases, though, right? When we're looking at cases that deal with space and time, right? And we're talking about potentially dimensions, Will we get to a point where AI is so sophisticated that it would be able to look at all the different cases that have dealt with, let's say, something to do with space and time and have a better conclusion of what's going on? I I don't know. Uh, the AI will certainly be one of the instruments that we want to use. We want to throw it at them and see how they can deal with it. Uh, 
my guess would be that uh, they're going to deal with it very well, but it would be interesting to 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 see that. They several of my dear friends in this research have given up because of the complexity of the situation, because there is the if we have if we face a technology that can disguise itself to that point where it can manipulate the space of time and the language environment, what else can it do? I mean, do we even, when we see a tic-tac, when we see a sphere, is it really a sphere? Or is it just an image that they can project, you know, an image of something that can become material when they want to? But it can change shapes. It can be something else. It can be a lot bigger if they want to. And and then, uh, what's the point of doing this research if it's well, essentially helpless? Uh, my friend M. A. Michel in France essentially gave up because he he was in situations where, with witnesses who were doctors who were. Uh, scientists and so on, who had seen something and had been completely confused with the, the, just the topology or with the with the interaction, to the point where their science was essentially useless. So, if we come to that point, maybe that will be the end of our interaction with it. You know where we give up. But the AI isn't going to give up. So maybe the we we can, you know, just like you send a a, a robot to explode, you know, a, a bomb. Uh, you don't send a human anymore to uh, to you know to uh, uh, to make it uh, you know, to make it uh, idle, and uh, you know the AI will be one one more tool. Um, it, it it will be an interesting day in in the field. I agree. So my last question to you, Jacques, is how could the government use AI now as a tool to research UAPs? We know that you've created a database a database in the past, but what could the government do now? as a best practice using the AI technology that we have now when looking into the UFO topic? Well, um, I, I think AI, AI, again, has many levels, just like you know, simple tools and complex tools uh, in, in a factory. The, uh, the simple tools that they, they should develop uh, it redeveloped was my my little robot that uh, would help you in interviewing a witness, you know, to save the time of the witness and to save your time and get a quality report, you know, so you're not, you know, asking questions that are irrelevant just because you have to fill out a piece of paper. The government is very good at getting you to fill questionnaires. We have to, you know, throw that into the garbage can and do it more, you know, in a way that's more intelligent, the AI can do that today. You know, uh, we, again, we, we have to start with the 200 hypotheses. No, it doesn't have to be the government. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Harvard is, you know, the, uh, the project there is, is doing that very well. Galileo, you know, has already developed something like that so uh, it's it's fun it's it's fun to do it's fun to develop it's not supremely difficult because you know you know what the instruments can do so you can, and and you're asking this of a, a a human being or you're asking it of a device that you control so again that's uh, the the more complex one is um when you 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 have a a situation that involves something like the Nimitz, when you have multiple observers, you need to control the system, and you you cannot predict 
where the object is going to go, and you have to control the, uh, 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 a large number of parameters. And that is you know, something that uh, uh, should be developed, um, certainly by, initially by the military, because the military has the resources. And, and also some of the more interesting devices are, uh, you know, are secret, are, are classified. So it, uh, it, it will first happen in, in the classified domain, and then it can be applied to in, uh, in aviation, for example, or in, just to determine is, is that a threat or is it not a threat, and determine fast enough so that people can begin to, to react. And um, that could save lives, you know, and this could be, uh, it could have rewards very quickly. What the system can do is acquire a lot more data that we can analyze later than we would do with normal instruments in the field, because it can acquire everything at the same time, which again is, is a principle, uh, you know, in uh, in Galileo. I, I think it's it's a wonderful application of of AI. Yeah, I think that there's going to be multiple different applications in the future that will be exciting, scary, innovative. You know, we'll be able to look at UFO data and cross uh, cross collaborate it with other data and come to maybe hopefully some better conclusions. I, I plan to do uh, with my data, you know, completely unclassified, you know, civilian data, but from all over the world. And uh, you don't need, you know, a super sophisticated database to do that. You can, as as uh, we see now with chat, GPT, and so on, we can do it with the English text we have now. So I'm looking forward to doing that just on my own. Right. At the civilian databases that are being built right now using AI is unbelievable. And hopefully the civilians that are doing the work will use that data for for positive use rather than maybe negative and maybe not selling that data. But I am excited that yourself and other people are creating those databases that will be hopefully, you know, public to to everyone to view and to open source so they could do their own research. Yes. But the larger problems um, we have to place at a higher level and we but we have to continue to analyze them and work on them. It's true. It was very true. Jeez. Thank you so much, Jock, for spending time with me today and thank you for being rebelliously curious. Bye bye.